Thank you very much, friends, for coming. Thank you for taking time out of your busy lives and, and schedules and giving us an opportunity to, to be together. Uh, I have this rather trite way of starting every single talk that I give, uh, which is to thank people for the gift of your time. And that's actually something that comes out of Rumi's teachings, uh, which states that the number of breaths that we get to take in our lifetime is measured. It is finite, and there is no power on earth that can add or subtract a single breath to what is intended for us. Given that finite nature, then the decision for us to come together and spend an hour of our life is actually something that bears an ethical responsibility. And Rumi's teachings would lead us to hope that we come away from this time together kinder, more aware of our interconnectedness, more aware of this one very tiny, tiny planet that we all share, and uh, how we are all gonna get along together. So with that, uh, this no uh, And um, these days, if you take a look around us, there is no shortage of discussion about religion, about the role of religion, and the role of religion in public life. A lot of what we see, however, is the tendency of people to want to use religion as a means of dividing people against people. And I think all of us are far too familiar, both in our own traditions, whatever that tradition happens to be, and also in each other's traditions, of the ways in which religion can become a force for divisiveness. Uh, thanks to the good graces of the friends at the library, we actually have a chance to come together for something slightly different, which is a voice that comes right out of the heart of a deep spiritual tradition. It is an unmistakably religious and simultaneously humanistic voice that starts with a bold, an audacious claim that the universe that we all inhabit is brought into being through an unleashing of divine love. It is love that brings the universe into creation. It is love that sustains the universe. And it's love that's going to take us home. <coughs> So simultaneously in reading Rumi's poetry, we have someone who's going to move with ease and grace from erotic love poetry to talking about the love of God, to talking about the woman who screwed up, who screwed a donkey, to talking about homoerotic poetry, love between friends. In short, everything that we tend to see in the human community shows up in, in his poetry. And uh, this particular poet, whom uh, I'm referring to as the master of the alchemy of love, and I'll come back to that word alchemy as well as love in just a second. If you're hearing the sound of rain, just let yourself think, and this is supposed to increase you in your understanding of Muslim cultures, <laughs> that in virtually all Muslim cultures, rain is a sign of divine mercy. <laughs> right? And of course, if you come from a desert culture, you understand that life depends on those rare occasions when you do have, you have rain coming down, so we're grateful for it. And this being, uh, Molana Jalaluddin, known in the West as Rumi, in the East he's simply referred to as Molana, which means our master, our teacher. Right? Think about how influential a person has to be where you can go from Iran to Turkey to Central Asia to certain parts of South Asia and you can just mention to people, I was reading a poem by our master and people know exactly who you're talking about. That's a guy who's really made it and he's made it not because he was wealthy, not because he was powerful, but because there was an insight about the human condition 
and about the transformative aspect of love that shows up in his poetry as well as in his own uh, life. Fortunately, over the course of the last 20 years or so, folks on this side of the ocean have also been um, enchanted by him. And in the late 1980s, there was an article that showed up in the Christian Science Monitor, which proclaimed the same Rumi as the best-selling poet in the English language. So I suppose if something is best-selling, it says something. Um, we want to take a look at other things that are best-selling these days, unless we be divert. So let's, uh, let's take a look at what we've got here, alchemy and love, and use that as our, our starting point. I want to emphasize that when Molana, when our master, our teacher, Rumi, is talking about love, he's not merely talking about sentimentality. This isn't Valentine's Day, roses and hearts and full moons kind of stuff. Love encompasses the romantic, the sensual, the erotic, but it goes far beyond that. When he speaks of love, he's really speaking about fire. He's speaking about a fire that takes whatever in us is raw, is uncooked, and cooks it. His assumption is that we're not, contrary to what some of our New Agey friends would tell us, we're not all fine. We're not just these perfectly realized gods and goddesses inhabiting this world, because if we were, this world wouldn't look like it does. <laughs> that there is, in fact, a process of transformation and redemption that's necessary for us to become who it is that we've been all along. Right? This is one of the constant refrains in his poetry. Take a look at a horse. A horse does what God intends for horses to do. Rain clouds, rain, they do what God intends for them to do. Butterflies and grass and the wind all live as they were intended to. The one being that doesn't is the human being. And he says, we are this paradox. We can be loftier than the angels and lower than the love. And so the metaphor that he uses to talk about the human condition, and here one has to apologize on behalf of the human community to the jackass community, <laughs> he says, you are a jackass with wings of angels tacked onto you. And we see this in our dealings with one another. At times, Again, with apologies to the stereotyping about jackasses, you see those tendencies, those qualities come up, and then at the same time you see the angelic, and not merely the angelic, but also the divine show up. And we are always in between these two qualities. Which side of the divide, which part of the spectrum we end up going to, has to do with how willing we are to complete the journey of our lifetime. That is the journey of going from being raw to being cooked. <coughs> Towards the end of his life, when he's already become well known in multiple countries, there was a traveler that came to see him from a far distance and said to him, tell me about your life. Tell me what you've learned. And he responds with this very simple and short one-line poem. The whole of my life can be summed up in these three little words, three little phrases. I used to be raw. Then I was cooked. Now I'm on fire. 
And that's part of what draws people to him and continues to draw people to him for the last 800 years or so. Think about the metaphor. It's one thing to take your journey from being raw to being cooked. But he doesn't stop there. When he describes his own heart as being on fire, the implication is that whoever and whatever comes into proximity with him has an opportunity to complete their own journey. And they come, and I hope in some small parts, we have come, not because we're already perfect, not because we're done. There's no fork that should be stuck in us. <laughs> We come precisely because we're not done yet. There's this notion that you begin with humanity where they are. And in fact, if you were to go down to the library and ask for the translation of the book that's widely considered to be his masterpiece, the Masnavi, he begins this book not, not by talking about how lovely it's going to be when you figure out who you're supposed to become. He doesn't begin by telling you someday love is going to come and find you and you're going to see the face of God here and now. He actually begins with a musical analogy. And part of that it was, is what was playing in the room as many of you came in here. It's the sound of a reed flute playing, of the neigh, which looks, it's a show and tell. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like this. It's a bamboo shoot, essentially, that has been cut from a bed of reeds. And Turkish musicians, I won't. <laughs> Out of kindness and compassion <laughs> and deep, deep love <laughs> for you all. Turkish musicians and Persian musicians and South Asian musicians play this beautiful flute. And if you listen to its sound and you ask people how would you describe it, very few people would say, oh, it's got a nice bounce to it. <laughs> Nobody says it's kind of a beat. It's a haunting sound, even mournful, sorrowful. And the poem that he begins with in the Masnavi is that he compares our condition to the reed flute. He says, listen to this reed tell its tale and how it was cut from its home. So the very beginning of the story is this notion that you and I have a home, and it's not necessarily here. We were brought here, much like my son Amir, perhaps against our will. <laughs> <laughs> but, and here's my hope for this occasion and perhaps this whole life, there is still goodness that can come. There's still art that can emerge through atrocity and there's beauty that can emerge through suffering. So he starts out his poem essentially by a story of homesickness. Homesickness which can take many different forms. It can be homesickness of being away from loved ones. They are people that when you are with them, you feel whole and complete. And for some part of our life, perhaps far too long, we are forced to live away from them. It might be a parent that passes away. It might be a loved one that comes into your life and then is gone. Heaven forbid, it might be someone who tragically passes away. For other people, it's a homesickness of a physical, cultural type, geographical homesickness. There's a place where you go to and you feel like, I'm at home here and you are forced, because of the realities of life, employment, 
whatever the case might be, exile, to go live somewhere else. And this was his own life. He was born partially in where we tend to think of today as Afghanistan, travels through what's today Iran, and ends up living in what's today Turkey. But then there's another homesickness, which is, he says, we have another home. And we're here now, but we're going to go home. And the task is, how do we make this place also a home? How do we learn to live here and not merely endure it, but actually become who it is that we've been all along? So he uses this amazing metaphor that if you get this, you will understand almost everything in his poetry, which is, in order to turn this bamboo shoot, this reed, into a flute, it has to be cut. Then it's got to be hollowed out. You empty it of whatever is inside of it. And then you take a metal rod, you put it in the fire until it's white hot, and you start pressing it against the reed to create holes. Six on one side, one on the back. It's only when the reed has been hollowed out that the breath of the musician can flow through it. And his metaphor is, our essential human condition is also like this. There is nothing that you and I have to do to learn to love one another. There is nothing that you and I have to do to learn to live together. What we are intended to do is to remove the obstacles from that same channel of God's love that is already flowing through the cosmos. It's kind of like the metaphor, since I've had some personal experience with this, as you would guess from my rather portly shape, um, it's kind of the experience of having a heart attack. And if you've got veins and arteries that are clogged up by plaque, the blood can't flow. You want to remove the plaque so that the blood can flow. For Rumi, the universe is already animated by God's love. But it's got these blockages. And the blockage is not us, it's a part of us. It's the ego. It's the thing in you that looks at another human being, looks at a property, looks at an item, looks at anything, and says, mine! <laughs> Me wants it. My precious. You must have it. Having raised along with my wife a few children, it's that worst part of this sandlot kind of the playground mentality. If I saw it, it's mine. If I touched it, it's mine. If I thought about it, it's mine. If I licked it, it's mine. If I, if I was gonna play with it, it's mine. <laughs> And part of what Rumi wants to talk about is that all that we have to do is to remove these blockages from us. If we can remove that ego, if we can remove the rawness, then what's going to flow is going to be nothing other than that divine love. And of course, what removes it there is no magic pill, there is no blue pill or purple pill. It's the hard work of love and of service. So here's one of the places that we come back to that jackass with the angel wing. That for Rumi's poetry, if you want to find God, if you want to find yourself, you've got to deal with the most difficult of the creatures the human. There is no escape. You cannot run to a cave or a mountaintop or under the ocean or on the moon to find God. 
there is a path to God. There are seven billion paths to God, but it goes right through the heart of humanity. And unless you can get the human part right, you're not going to get the God part right. So that is the starting point of the Mass Nadine. For our benefit and much to our gratitude, he goes on through about 60,000 lines of poetry. And this is just one of his books. <laughs> the guy does, has, he has an issue with being brief. He writes about 100,000 lines of poetry. And they are exquisite. Remarkable lines of poetry, 99% of them in Persian, a few in Arabic, a couple of Turkish words, a couple of Greek words, right? kind of a cosmopolitan type. And time and again, he <coughs> also comes to this realization, as any great artist does, as any great musician does, that you can't become hooked, you can't become who you're intended to be by reading a book. So he's got these poems, beautiful poems, love poems, simultaneously about the human being and God, which he's going through talking about the way of transformation, and then he stops the poem and goes, you finish it. And you're like, you who? <laughs> and he says, you, you. And you're like, you, me? And he says, you, you. And it's this disorienting moment when a poet starts speaking to the reader. And he draws you in and says, my poetry is like fresh made bread. Don't let it become stale. Eat it and get to work. And because he's such a fantastic poet, and there's extraordinary stories here of the king and the maiden, and the lion and the rabbit, and the minister, and you know the wife and the husband, and you're reading it, and then at some point he goes, knock, knock, like, who's there? Like, room. <laughs> and he goes, guess where is the king? You are the king. You are the king, and you are the maiden. You are the lion, and you are the rabbit. You are the husband, and you are the wife. These characters are not outside of you. All that they represent is a set of qualities internal to you. They're spiritual qualities in you. His son, had to write a commentary on this beautiful book. And his son was a little less um, diplomatic than Rumi. He said, I have to write this commentary because people are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> they keep reading my dad's poems, and they keep thinking that he's talking about a king and a maiden and a lion and a rabbit. It's us. All of these characters are us inside. And then there's also that word alchemy that I have used in, in here. And alchemy is something that um, comes up periodically. You know, I've got beautiful children who are in elementary school and middle school. And from time to time in science books, you know, you see the one little gray shaded box in the corner, um, which is like, the modern science of chemistry owes a great deal Muslim scientists who in a medieval age had a science called alchemy. Many of the words that we have in the English language that start with A-L actually come from the Arabic language, such as algorithm and algebra. And I'm sitting there going, for the love of God, people already hate Muslims. <laughs> if you tell school children that Muslims invented algorithms and algebra, who is going to love us? <laughs> Tell them we invented iPhones. <laughs> Tell them we, which is half true. 
Steve Jobs had a Syrian dad. Uh, oh, see? That's what I'm talking about. iPhone thing is kind of an interesting example, and, and uh, Rumi's teachings kind of relate to this. I teach primarily 18 to 22-year-old college kids, which is to say, addicts. <laughs> I ban electronics from my classroom because I want this. <laughs> because he tells us that the greatest of truths are not to be found on a page. They have to be conveyed heart to heart, face to face, eye to eye. So no laptop because I don't trust you. Because I know when I sit on the other side, you're on Facebook, you're on Gchat, you're on eBay, you're on this and that. And I see these young people come into their classrooms when this little idol, which is what it is, it's not the golden calf anymore, they would choose this over sex. Which is actually true. There's a sizable percentage of our nation that will choose getting on their iPhone over having sex. Something is seriously messed up there. <laughs> we need therapy urgently for the sake of our marriages and our society. And when they've gone for an hour and 15 minutes in class without getting on their iPhones, they come out, they're like, they're kind of trying to who has been thinking of me? If their little battery under iPhones is on the red side, minus 20%, plugging in and charging is a matter of cosmic and existential crisis. <laughs> Next time you're in a coffee shop or a library, watch where these young folks are sitting. They're not sitting in the most comfortable chair, and they're not sitting by the most beautiful window. They're sitting where the plugs are. What does he tell us time and time again? Know your own heart. You cannot know God unless you know your own heart. What kind of society would we have, whatever your religious background or none happens to be, if we actually paid as much attention to the charge level of our hearts as we do to the batteries on our electronics, and that notion of knowing yourself, knowing yourself as an intertwined part of knowing God, is one of his essential teachings. So coming back to alchemy, if what we get in our science books is that alchemy was the science of making gold, well, no. Alchemy was a metaphor for taking what is leaden in us, what is base in us, and making it become illuminated, making it become golden. It's this acknowledgement that all of us have things in us which are like lead. We're not already divine, but we can get there. And what gets you from lead to gold is love. Love which is not sentimental, love which is not easy, love which is like fire. It burns away all of the impurities in you. The ego cannot stand that fire. Because when you've devoted yourself in loving service to another person, what will remain is the presence of God. Now, Rumi doesn't invent all of this material. He's the heir to a poetic and a mystical tradition that by his time is already 400 years old in the Islamic tradition. And this is the first time after 28 minutes that I've used the word Islam in this conversation and I think all I will say is, if you travel from India to Istanbul, 
and you count the number of manuscripts. Remember, there was a time that you couldn't go to Amazon and Barnes and Noble to buy books. <laughs> and every book had to be hand copied. Imagine a book that's got 60,000 lines. So for somebody to want a copy of it, they really had to want a copy of it. <laughs> Other than the Quran, there is no book that Muslims copied more frequently than Rumi's poetry. You can really make the argument that no other text has shaped Muslims' spiritual and aesthetic understandings of what it means to be human, what it means to love, what it means to lose, what it means to find, what it means to strive for God, other than the Quran, more so than, than Rumi's writings. And he comes out of this tradition that's already aware of the fact that just because you're religious doesn't mean you're beautiful. And certainly we don't need reminders of that in our own day and age. So he comes out of this legacy in which the poets that have come before him and whom he has been raised with tell you these kinds of stories where on the day of judgment, God collects up all the human beings that have ever lived. I think it was hard to get a seat in here today. <laughs> and the voice of God comes to them and says, who here wishes to be spared hellfire? 90% of people put up their hands. And the voice of God comes to them and says, it is granted. All of you who raise your hands are spared hellfire. Then the voice of God comes and says, Who in here wishes to be given the loftiest and most luminous paradise with rivers and gardens and maidens like no eye has ever seen and no imagination has ever conceived? 90% of those who are there raise their hand and God says, it is yours. That lofty and luminous paradise is granted to you. And they leave. And there's but a handful of people left. And this time, these poets tell us, the voice of God comes thundering at them, saying, I offered you salvation from hellfire and you chose it not. I gave you my most luminous paradise, and you did not accept it. What are you here for? And it's these few remaining people who say, we did not come here to be spared hellfire. We did not come here for paradise. We came for you. And then these poets tell us, this time, voice of God comes to them gently and says, in that case, I am yours. That's the tradition that Rumi comes from, where the goal is not salvation. The goal is actually God, and God not in some other universe, here and now in this very life. What would we live like if we were mindful of the fact that the breath that we take is none other than the Spirit of God? Which in Hebrew, in Arabic, in Persian, the words for spirit and breath are one and the same. What would we do and what would we not do if we were mindful of the fact that in every cycle of breathing, there is a spirit of God entering and departing your chest. And what would it mean if, in, in the first book of the Masnavi, he uses this phrase, child of the moment. Child of the moment. That if you wish to have this alchemy, if you want to be transformed, 
you have to be a child of the moment. Partially what he means by it is, having observed people very carefully, he says the majority of people are living for either hope or fear of what's going to come in the future. I'm going to die. My loved ones are going to die. I'm going to graduate from college. I'm never going to find a job. That's what my kids are worried about. Or you're living attached to some past trauma. Mommy, give me love. May I have your attention, please? There is a silver CRV in a hand spot in our car parking lot with a light on. And what would it mean if rather than projecting yourself onto the future and throwing yourself back onto past trauma, you realize that the one place that you can actually be is the present moment. How are you supposed to be whole if you're always divided against your own self? So what kind of lesson does he have? Very concrete practical lessons like, I love this phrase, have your heart be where your feet are. Have your heart be where your feet are. If you're in here, just for the moment, put aside the grocery shopping that you have to do and the dinner that you have to cook and the children that have to be made and the job that may or may not be coming and the mommy that did or didn't love you. For that moment, have your heart be where your feet are, and then the next minute, be there in the grocery store, be there in the cooking of the dinner. Part of Rumi's observations is simply that it's impossible for us to find the one God if we ourselves are already torn apart. If we have to be mirrors for God, the first step is we have to be one. And we have to be one internally, and we have to be one together. That as long as we have a perspective that says, I will love me, me, myself, and I, my three favorite people in the world. <laughs> or, I will love my family, screw y'all. Or, I love my social class. I love my political party. I love people who happen to have my kind of hair, my kind of skin, my kind of religion, or that most potent of modern viruses. I love the people who live under my flag more than I love people who happen to be born under somebody else's. Somehow, supposedly, since the Supreme Court said that it cured racism, Thank God. <laughs> Sarcasm font. <laughs> 36. Um, we're, we're able to at least talk about that. But somehow we still have this notion that because we happen to be an American or Canadian or this or that, that you're somehow exceptional above and beyond somebody else. And this, these are the kind of tricks of the ego that he keeps, keeps talking about. So part of the goal is just to become a real human being. There's nothing more precious. He's living in a part of the world where there are Jews, there are Christians, there are Persians, there are Arabs, there are Kurds, there are Armenians, there are people with the Greek philosophical tradition. So he takes a lot of stories that you might have seen in Aristotle and Plato. Here, he takes the story of Diogenes, and he twists it of Diogenes, this he just calls him sage, a sage walking around the city in broad daylight with a lit torch. And people say, look, what's, what's going on? It's an odd thing. The torch makes sense at nighttime, but not in the daytime. And the sage, the Greek sage, answers in perfect Persian, he says, as divo dad malula in sauna Jesus, I am sick and tired of these two-legged demons. What I want 
is one real human being. The people say, ah, oh, a human being. None of those is found here. We've looked, they're extinct. And then Rumi says, that one that is not to be found, that's the one that I seek to find. And if I cannot find one, so help me God, I will become one. So just this awareness that there is something sacred and divine in us, but we have to be true to that. We have to realize who it is that we're intended to, to become. And if in the beginning of the book he starts you out with the state of homesickness, with the state of being cut off and isolated from God, this also reflects the people that are gathered around him. He lives in what's today Turkey, in a part of the world where there's a very um, elegant culture. You're expected to dress a certain way. You're expected to speak a certain way. Many of you who might have had an opportunity to travel in certain Muslim cultures, you would see that it would be unusual for people to speak without throwing lines of poetry into their speech. Uh, my father, who's not, a, who's not a professional poet, he's a physician, I think I've probably heard him recite from memory at least 600 poems, you know, Baba John, sweet daddy, how are you today? Well, since you asked, you know, just good would do, but you know, instead of like, you get like 14 lines of poetry, my state is like the rosebud that opens up, and as it opens, it gives the fragrance, and if ever I injure your heart, remember that the rose comes with the thorn. <laughs> I mean, this is like every freaking day. <laughs> with people. And, and his world is very much like this. You're expected to have a certain measure of elegance. And we know that the court system around him, that they, um, that they admired Rumi, they did not admire the people around him. And this is a poem that is attributed to him. You see this in Rumi's shrine when you go. Uh, it's quite well known and it's been sung in American circles since the 1960s. Come, come, whoever you are. Wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you've broken your vows, your repentance a hundred times. Come, come again, come. And again, you come not because you're already good, not because you're already luminous, not because you're already perfect, but simply because you have a desire to be better than who you are today. And that is something that we see in his own lifetime. The king of the city that Rumi used to live in loved him, loved his poetry, loved his teachings, did not love the circle of people around him. And if you look at the stories, and by the way, we've got about 800 pages of stories about Rumi's life. Right? There's actually very few pre-modern figures that we know more about what their day-to-day -day life was like. And if you read the names of people in her circle, it's like Bob the Smith, <laughs> Ali the Shoemaker, Jennifer the Farmer. Right? These are not the 1% of society. And so what the king says about them is the worst thing that you can call somebody in Persian culture which is that they have bad adab, meaning they have bad manners, bad etiquette. And the word of this gets back to the roomy circle and it breaks their hearts. And Rumi says, come, let's all go together to the king's court. And they march on over there. And he looks at the king and he says, did you say about my followers that they've got bad manners. And the king is very embarrassed, very ashamed, puts his head down and says, I did. And very sorry. And 
Bob the Smith and Jennifer the Farmer, and all of them are super excited because they're going to give it to him now. It's going to smack down. And instead, Rumi says, everything you say about them is true. They're rude, they're mean, they're ugly, and they've got the worst other possible. And then he says, this is why I took them off. If they were already beautiful, I would have become their disciple. <laughs> and then he says, everyone laughs at me because I go around buying fake gold. They think I've lost my mind. What they don't know is that I have the secret of alchemy. It doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what class of society, if you can put people in a loving community and love the heaven out of them, that very group will become luminous because the presence of God is in them as much as it is in the courts. This is one of the insistences that he has. And again, one of the points that we see through these 800 pages of stories is you have to be willing to find God in what, in a biblical context, we would call the least of these. Don't just say Matthew, chapter 25. A good lesson for those people who just cut food stamps, $40 billion. That which you do to the least of these, you do unto me. Where's that in this world today? So what does he do? He goes around room, goes around the society, and everybody who's marked as an other, an inferior, social inferior, he shows special love and affection and respect towards them. So who is marked as an other? This is a Muslim majority society, Christians. Christians are the minority there. There's a monk, Christian monk, that travels a long way because he's read by Rumi's teaching, has come to have a lot of admiration for him. The monk comes to have just a chat with him, and he sees him, says, are you, are you like Mr. Rumi? He says, I am. And the monk bows down in respect. And he stands up to start talking, and he notices that Rumi is still bowing down to him. So the monk says, I put my head back down. <laughs> and I sat down, and then I lifted up my head, and I saw that he was still down. So I went back down. And the monk says, 33 times I lifted up my head, and 33 times I saw that he was still bowing down to me. And I finally threw up my hands and I cried out, where do you get this humility from? And why are you showing me that supposedly I'm not even one of your team? And the only answer that Rumi has is that God made you and God sustains you. If I do not show respect to you, to whom will I show it? So this kind of a lesson for us of the ways in which uh, humility has to become part of this uh, religious ethic is, is important. And, um, and it comes about through this practice of, of love. Here what I've got is a couple of images of what the Masnavi looks like in Persian so in English, it would look like this. Uh, this is the oldest copy of Rumi's Masnavi. And I've got a copy of it here, which is an exact replica of the oldest copy of Rumi's Masnavi. It's from the year 1278. If your hands are clean, <laughs> and if we all can love and trust each other, I'll pass this around. If this does not make it back to me, I will, so help me God, never give another copy of my So I'm going to pass this around.
around, starting over here. And what I ask you to do is, remember that it starts on the right-hand side, just to have a chance to pay attention to the level of care and detail that would have gone to producing this possible book. And here's a hint about what it means to read in this Muslim culture. The technique that they use is almost identical to what you would see in biblical works of illumination and in Quranic illumination and calligraphy, which is they've got the text in the middle, and then you see these medallions that point off the page, over here, and little tiny arrows over there. What does that mean? It means that you look for God in three places. Yes, in scripture. Yes, inside yourself. But what do you see if your eyes start on the page and follow it off the page using the arrows? What do you end up in? The world. That the world is also a scripture. That the natural cosmos deserves to be treated with just as much loving care as the scrolls of the Torah or the Quran or the Bible, right? And this was a very common understanding <coughs> during this time period, so much so that they spoke about two kinds of scripture, the written down scripture and the natural scripture. So I'm gonna pass this around and I will. So help me God. <laughs> See this again. Oh my We're almost winding down. So I still have an hour. And I expect to use every last minute of it. I've got eight minutes and six seconds left. Here's again another copy of the Masnavi, this one from India from the year 1663. And you can see the gold work that uh, has been woven into it. I want to give you a couple of lines of his poetry and tell you some ways in which his poems are intertwined around teachings that hopefully everybody and anybody can uh, weave into their life. This is a caravanserai. It's a caravanserai in uh, Turkey that um, over the summer times I end up taking people there. I see Zeba sitting back there. She was a friend that came with us a few years ago. Think of this as a combination of hotel and convention center. Right? When people would go on caravans, they would stay here for two, three days and do barter and trade and then you would set out on your own way, and it's a fortified place, so you would be safe during this time. The metaphor, and so everybody in society knew about being on a caravan <coughs> and having a caravan arrive, the place that the caravans would stop in. What Rumi does is to take that <coughs> metaphor, and as with everything else, he says, this is not about a building out there, it's about you. Treat your heart like a caravanserai. Every emotion that comes to you, welcome it, welcome it, and be a gracious host. Look, now comes joy. Welcome, joy. You can stay for a while, and I know that you will leave. Now comes sadness. Welcome sadness. Make sadness be at home and know that it will leave. And we think about even in terms of the words that we use, you ask somebody how you're doing, and they're like, I am sad. I am happy. So we're actually identifying with these emotions that are coming and going. And he's saying, treat them as guests. None of them are permanent. Welcome them, let them be at home, 
and bid them farewell. The other way that he puts it is to have this saying that he keeps repeating in story after story after story, in means bogzalat, this too shall pass. <coughs> this too shall pass. In Turkish, it's one thing to say this too shall pass when you're going through a rough time, when your child is sick, when you're experiencing poverty, when you're in a bad relationship, this too shall pass. And you got indigestion. Why do you think that? Classic. <laughs> it's another thing to be willing to say, this too shall pass, when you're experiencing joyous times of life. When everything is hunky-dory, when somebody loves you, and you want them to love you, not the creepy guy in the street corner. <laughs> when you've got money, when you're healthy, when you have hair, <laughs> that brief moment of my life when I've got hair, <laughs> to be willing to look in the mirror and say, this too shall pass. That is part of the metaphors that, that he's cultivating for, for this life. Here's another one that um, I've personally been uh, struck by, and I ended up writing something based on this after the um, Boston Marathon shooting. Um, and it's a short poem of, of his, but boy, what a powerful one. It says, the wound is where the light enters you. The wound is where the light enters you. In other words, it's not just a matter of surviving an injury, a harm, a difficulty, but oftentimes in life, those opportunities to grow and to become who you're intended to be are already contained inside the room. And what do we do? Stab, you know, pull away at the scab or just try to cover it up. It says, sit with the wound. Look at the wound and look at the light entering through the wound. Because, he says, the one that sends you the injury is the same one that is sending you the healing. And, you know, with all the usual footnotes about it's not talking about an abusive relationship, if someone's abusing you, get the hell out, and you deserve better, and call the police, and all of that. But, you know, other than those kinds of things. Uh, I use that as a metaphor in light of the Boston Marathon shooting, uh, for us as a nation to have had a conversation about what would it be like if we were willing to have a conversation which began by saying, we are injured, we are hurting, and is there a way of healing that we can have, both as Americans and as members of this broader human community, that would actually come about through this injury? That takes a lot of emotional and spiritual maturity. Uh, this is his uh, tomb site in, in Konya, which is a place that is visited to this day by millions of, of people every year. Um, and so he's not just a poet, but someone that people look to as a spiritual exemplar. And about half of the people who go to see him don't necessarily come from Muslim background. Right, and so it become an international figure in, in that sense. This is Konya in Turkey. Um, and that's what it looks like from the outside. The picture that you saw is right under that teal dome that you see up there. Uh, and so this is a complex that dates back to the 13th century. Um, and uh, it has continued to serve as a pilgrimage center, though today, because of Turkish politics, it's uh, technically speaking a museum, but it's still a place of, of pilgrimage. And um, some of you have seen the performances of the World Dervishes, or you might um, have watched them on TV. Um, and it's, it's ironic that for us in English, World Dervishes has kind of become synonymous with like frantic activity, right? And it's actually the very opposite of that. It is a slow, meditative, 
dance, movement, which is actually a prayer. It is if prayer became a dance, if dance became a prayer. And the simple idea behind it, as you would see in many of the dervishes, is that one hand, the right hand, is turned up towards heaven, and the other hand is turned down toward the earth. In other words, your body becomes a channel, a channel of God's grace, so that you receive compassion and God's love from the heavens. It flows through your heart, and you release that onto creation. Not your love, but God's love. And there's this perfect uh, balance of motion, but one foot always on the ground. You have to remain anchored in life. You have to have your grounding as well as in motion. And I'll, um, I'll end with this and one last uh, quick little point. Um, any of the folks who are interested in coming to see Turkey and some of these sites, feel free to check out that site, uh, Illuminated Fours. We go every summer and it would be a joy to have people join us. I want to end with something, and I'll keep this as vaguely political as I possibly can. <laughs> and you all are an awesome, brilliant group, and I, I trust you to read between the lines. <laughs> what the heck does all of this love and poetry talk have to do with us today, when we got 45 million Americans living in poverty, when we've got millions of people in Syria being made refugees and 100,000 people killed, when the planet is melting from the top and we're not willing to ask the questions of what's happening in Colorado, possibly being related to things, and we've gotten so used to violence in our own society that we freak out when 12 people are shot in D.C., but if we did the math, we would figure out that this is not an anomaly this isn't every day. Every single day, that's how many people are killed by guns in our country. So why spend an hour of our life talking about love and poetry? Within the biblical tradition, within the Quranic tradition, which I would actually argue are linked up together fundamentally, there is a powerful reminder that love and justice are actually one. This is an insight that we have lost in much of our conversation. We speak about love as something private and justice, social justice, as something that takes place out there in the world that can maybe be legislated or maybe we have special interest groups talking about. The tradition that Rumi comes from is one in which it says, God commands you to love and justice. And that's a tradition that we have closer to our own method of words over here. We have, as part of the civil rights struggle, we have in the people who are the heirs to the legacy of Dr. King, who remind us that justice is what love looks like in public. Go out there and read Rumi's poetry. By all means, it is exquisite. But refuse the urge to make it be something that explains only the erotic desires of two people in private. If it is to have an ongoing relevance to us and to our lives today, I hope we can read it in that original context of that unleashing of God's love, which absolutely and categorically refuses to leave out any of God's children. So I took an hour of your time. I am thankful and grateful for you all having been here.